I can start a new TikTok account tomorrow. I can have that thing get a million views in two or three months. Everybody's question is, what's our ROI? How do I make money? No hustle worship here, we're a different breed. Action is what we got if action is what you need. Content capitalists, we're breaking the mold. Cause the old ways fade, new stories to be told. So content capitalists, get to the price. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Content Capitalist Podcast. Today I've got with me a guest and there's a good chance you have seen his work because the videos that he's helped his clients produce for himself and for his clients, a lot of them are hitting that seven figure mark. And what that means is a lot of people, probably one of you guys listening have seen his stuff. And uh, I'm really proud to have him on my show because I think that he is somebody who's a practitioner, not just someone who teaches theory on this, but who's actually doing it, seeing the results, tweaking and sharing with his audience how that's going. Ryan, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Ken. Appreciate it. Ryan, what I want you to do first before we, I, I know my editor is probably going to cut in some stuff with your feeds and stuff, but before we let the cat out of the bag, I want to hear it from you first. Well, what is it you actually do? What kind of clients do you help? And what do you help them achieve? I'm kind of like, I guess, a two-part person. Uh, part one would be um, I run a short-form content production agency. As far as I know, it was uh, the first ever uh, short form content production agency and based uh, on the fact that when I started focusing on TikTok, nobody really cared about TikTok. And I kind of did it as a, um, you know, I was like, I kind of foreshadowed this might be popular. At least I hoped it would be in the next year. And I was like, if I can just get myself to 100,000 followers so people would take me seriously and get some case studies of other people and get them to 100,000 followers, I can then start charging people to do their TikTok. Um, I had no idea you know, <laughs> that that would morph into real shorts. Like, I mean, at the time it was just TikTok and everybody hated it. <laughs> Nobody liked TikTok when I started doing it. And uh, that, you know, I was very fortunate to be, you know, <clears throat> early uh, in that regard. And then also what I would say, you know, I, I, I pride myself on our quality of work and that led to me land, you know, landing currently right now, we have 18 clients in my uh, short form agency. The agency is called Viral Edits. Um, it's very low key. Um, I joke, I call it like the black card. Um, it's like, you gotta be invited to it. Cause, um, the truth is we grew so fast. We couldn't even make a website or, and like, it was just word of mouth, word of mouth. And I work with, um, uh, my ideal client is obviously, uh, a level influencers and, you know, more business oriented education in influencers or who tends to gravitate towards me because we make educational content go viral and like some stats on that side of my company. Uh, we currently produce around 50 videos a day. Uh, we post around 100 videos a day. Um, on the average month, we post between 3,500 and 4,000 videos to all the platforms. Um, we have to date made almost, I believe, 1,500 viral videos, um, mostly focusing on TikTok, but that's all the other platforms as well. Um, and then on the other end of the spectrum, and, and that, well, the agency side, um, it grew from zero to, um, it is dark grossed over 2 million in sales since I started. Um, I have 14 uh, contractors that work for me, um, nine full-time video editors, uh, an operator, researchers, filmers, directors. Um, and, you know, we are just a very well-oiled, short-form producing machine. And uh, then I have my personal brand, which was always started to be, as you said, a practitioner of my company. Um, I test everything that we do with our clients on my, my account first. Uh, you know, and in that process, I've garnered um on tiktok specifically uh, i think it's around 140 million views to date so far um it's equally as impressive i would say on instagram and youtube shorts as well um i pretty much specifically focus on short form um i don't do much with long form except for podcasts like this and i just you know i i don't know exactly how many viral videos i have for myself but there's quite a few if you look at my page so um that's kind of like, you know, both of those together, my personal brand tends to grow my agency very well. Um, my agency, the clout of the clients that um, I work with, and I, I don't like to pimp out my clients per se, um, partially because I mean, I know you, you're very experienced in working with some high level people. Um, there's a lot of NDAs involved. There's a lot of things, you know, I'm fortunate that a lot of people do like to film with me. So there's a good chance if I'm filming in a video with somebody, we're probably working with them in some capacity. So I've kind of you know, been fortunate to grow that way as well. Um, I do a lot of collabs. Um, I'm known for doing asking pretty abrupt questions, uh, you know, to very wealthy people. So it's, uh, it's been an amazing ride to date. Thanks for the introduction and uh, that, that overview. Uh, something pops my mind because there's this, there's a buzzword 
that I think a lot of people will create their own meaning behind. But what does viral video mean to you every time you say it? I treat a viral video and for my company, because my, you know, just for context, my, my whole team is, I have optimized my company for what I consider viral video, which is 1 million views. Um, if you get a video with 1 million views, you are gone viral. There's like mega viral and super viral and like all that, which is like, I still haven't quite figured out what those are because we've had some five tens and I personally, um, most I've ever had is a 15. Um, I've had a client that got 48 million on a video. I don't know what that's called, but, um, yeah, I treat anything, you know, anyway, 800,000 to a million, like you're, you're getting recognized in the street, you know, that's pretty viral in my eyes. Uh, Ryan, so that's I have a kind proposal. Of, yeah. We, we should that? set up something called the Viral Standards Commission between the two of us. <laughs> and we will be the, the global authority on all the titles for what the levels of variety are. And then you know, I, I would to, love that. Yeah, the Viral Standards Commission. It, it could be kind of a joke. I, mean, I see Facebook whole, groups. Right, like, they do that? I, I see Facebook groups where they're like, oh yeah, I went viral. And they're like, I got 100,000 views. And I'm like, ah, I mean, that's a good video. Right? That's we not gotta viral, set some standards. Though. We got to set some standards. Right. It's, yeah, it's just a no, buzzword. I'm, I'm with you. Right? Yeah, we'll sign. So I'll sign like, that. I'll be the face of it. There you go. There you go. Viral Sanders <laughs> Commission, and then we'll send people like you know, you know how YouTube has the the the, the plaques, right? We'll have something yeah. smaller for every million dollar video. We'll, we'll officially send something to them. Yeah, uh, that could be it, fun. It's, it's definitely a buzzword, though. I mean, and there's a lot of misconceptions around viral um, that I partially can say that I'm responsible for because of the uh, a lot of my content speaks to going viral because. Um, quite, you know, I mean, I learned early on working with a lot of the people that we were working with, I kind of surpassed the influencers and business owners that were like, really trying to obviously monetize direct content. They were like, we already have monetization. We just want to be seen by everybody. You know, the more people that see me, I make more money. So Ryan, we want you to help us get seen by as many people as possible. So that was kind of how this whole thing started in my lap with some of my first clients. And I was just like, oh, okay. You know, no pressure there. Um, just, just make videos that get seen by the world. Okay, cool. Uh, I guess we'll figure this out. And that led into a whole different style, I think, of what is short form today. And that's kind of, you know, I'm fortunate to, like, because we were so early, we've kind of shaped the curve. I mean, I don't know about your DMs, but I, I've started a, an army of uh, agency owners that can make a certain style video, <laughs> you know, based on myself and my clients and, you know, everything else in between. So it's, it's been very, uh, it's been crazy. I don't know. It's, uh, it's, it's surreal because I was just, I've always just made videos my whole life. So this is a great segue. You said you've always made videos your whole life. What were you doing before you're actually getting paid to do it? Like, how did it start? Was this off a camcorder in high school or what? Um, not that soon. I was more, I, I was an extreme sports kid. So I grew up racing BMX, BMX right? Um, yeah. Yeah. I actually turned pro when I was 25 and I was working as a door and window salesman at Lowe's Home Improvement, which is like a department store, like Home Depot here in, in uh, you know, the U S. Um, I quit that because they would not allow me enough time off to go be a pro, pro BMX racer. So I was like, you know what? Fuck it. Let's, let's give this a whirl. I'm going to regret it if I don't try to be a pro BMX racer. And I did. Um, I actually was a pro BMX racer and I realized after about a year that they don't make a whole lot of money. Um, and that kind of morphed into, okay, I need to make money. Um, how do I do this? Because I'm racing all the time and I'm traveling, so I can't really have a, re a regular job anymore. Um, so I picked up a book. Um, you probably heard of it, The 4-Hour Workweek with Tim Ferriss. And uh, that book just kind of opened my eyes to selling products online. Um, and at the time, again, like, there was, this is like before YouTube. Um, I begged my parents to get me a video camera because yes, I was that broke at 20, 26, 27 years old. I was like, I need a video camera. I can make money with this. We'll get rich, dad. Can you? And you know, thankfully, I somehow managed to get a video camera. I don't know where it came from, but it was a flip cam. Um, I started recording my workouts and I started posting them, teaching BMXers how to get faster on their bikes. And uh, I basically, and then I turned that into a DVD. Um, I taught myself how to code. I made a website and then I taught myself how to sell DVDs through the internet. Um, this is before streaming was a thing before people get all uptight about it. Um, you know, this is, this is like my preferred platform at the time was Viddler, uh, because I, Gary, I remember v, that. Yeah. Yeah. Cause Gary V said Viddler was the best one and, um, it wasn't, I should have stuck with YouTube, but you know, um, 
But that was like, I, I self-funded, you know, I made videos, I got sponsorships for my videos, I, I made money from my videos early on. And I was like, this is crazy. So I always just kind of had that, you know, not a lot of money. I mean, we're talking three to $4,000 a month, like where I was like able to just, I could ride my bike. Um, I was never the best professional, but I was always, I was better than most amateurs. So like I had that weird, you're never going to make like the six figures as a pro, but you're just too good to go back to being an amateur. Um, so, you know, I did that for a while, kind of burned myself out. And then that morphed into um, affiliate marketing. I took those same video skills and I started reviewing workout programs and doing product reviews back from using off of ClickBank. And um, I just started doing reviews at scale. I'd do like 10 a day and I would post them to YouTube and they would rank. And then I started an army of affiliate websites and I started, um, you know, doing what they call, I'm sure you, I know you've been in the game a long time. So like they were Google sniper sites was the term. Um, I had about 500 of them at one point. Um, I was doing very well with those sites, uh, selling affiliate products, uh, mainly fitness niche. Cause I always kind of stuck with things that I was, I enjoyed, which is in, in this case, it was like BMX racing and then working out. So, um, that was, you know, I did that for a while. Um, Google changed their algorithm, all that kind of collapsed. And then, um, I was forced to kind of create a real business because I was really good at like what I would call hobby money. I would just, I could figure out how to make like 10 grand really fast. And then I would be like, okay, I made that. So I wouldn't work for a while and I'd spend that and I'd be like, oh, I need to make more money again. You know, and I did that off and on for most of my 20s. You know, I don't recommend people do that. It's not very stable, um, but it, you know, I was traveling, I was riding, I was an athlete, like so it kind of worked for me in a, in a way. But, uh, you know, after doing that for a while, um, I actually, um, met my current now current fiance i wanted something a little more sustainable um and i kind of fell into youtube but from the men's style and fashion angle um i started teaching guys how to dress better to get laid and i actually that all that is still on youtube if people search my name i refuse to delete it i will have that conversation with my now seven-year-old daughter at some point that your dad taught people how to seduce women through their clothes um and uh, i made a lot of videos uh, more on the volume scale um i was fortunate I didn't really take off massively. I, I, I was very good at getting attention and views, but I, at that time I wasn't really great at getting followers. Um, but I got a lot of attention from like the fashion world. Um, I got signed to an agency, um, Menfluential Media. They sponsored, uh, they, they brought on a lot of the current biggest fashion influencers like um, Alpha M, Jose Zuniga, like teaching men's fashion. Like they're all a part of that. I was very late to that party. Whereas like I came in kind of at the tail end of the popularity there. Um, and I did that for about two or three years and I just got really burnt out um, because it wasn't that I didn't like what I was doing. It was just that I was basically almost engaged and I had a daughter now and I just didn't want to be teaching that type of content anymore. Um, it just wasn't who I was. Um, so I, so I basically just quit and fell into agency work um, because I didn't really know what to do, but I knew how to make videos to get attention started doing ad ads for people. A lot of the companies that sponsored me to make fashion videos, I just called them up. I'm like, Hey, you know, I know you like my videos. So like, how about I just come do ads for you? Will you pay me to do that? And for, some of them said, yes, yeah. someone put me on a retainer. Um, and then that was like, I fumbled around with that for a year or two. And then, uh, then right around when the, you know, the pandemic started, it was when TikTok was really starting to take notice. And that's when I was like, I can be early to TikTok and my whole life, I had been slightly late to things, you know, like I was late to YouTube with the fashion. I was late to Instagram because I was focusing on YouTube. So I was like, TikTok, early adopter. It might work. It might not. I got some savings. The world shut down. I'm kind of going to be broke if I don't figure something out. And uh, I went all in on, on TikTok. And, you know, I was fortunate within like three to six months, um, I had my first paying client just for TikTok. And that was $750 a month is all I could get somebody to pay to, to repurpose their content for TikTok. Um, and then the second one, I think was like 1500 a month. Um, I just kept trying to double my prices. Um, and then I was very fortunate uh, because I was one of the first uh, agencies. Uh, Grant Cardone's team sought me out. Um, I signed Grant Cardone. We still work with him to this day. Uh, he was like the whale client. Um, we grew his TikTok from zero to almost 2 million now. Um, and then because of Grant and the success that we had with him, it led to a lot of other very high-end clients. And that's kind of how the trajectory has gone. 
and I've since just kept trying to raise my prices, raise my prices to now. Um, we currently charge for most clients is around ten thousand dollars a month, um, and with full service production agency. So, yeah, that's a that was like the the past. But I mean, the the one constant in my whole life was like I can create my way out of being broke, um, and that and that was something that I kind of took to heart. Um, I taught myself how to edit. Um, my dad was a video editor, but I never actually had him teach me. Um, I just kind of watched. Um, and then when it came time for me needed to learn the skill set, I just kind of figured it out. I don't know if I can credit it to my dad, but he definitely had influence on me as on that on that aspect. Uh, but I never had him formally teach me. But he did help me make that DVD, though. So I do have to. And and I did lie to him because I said we would get rich teaching BMXers how to get faster on their bike, and unfortunately, that did not happen. So yeah, yeah. Thanks for that story. When he told me the story about the BMX bike. Reminded me of, I think, really early days. Russell Brunson, he did this potato gun product yeah. on DVD. Do you remember that? That we I, I see a lot of parallels there. Yeah, we were. I bought that DVD. Me and uh, yeah. uh, my guy Luis, that he's here right now. He works with me. We were talking about that yesterday. We're like, I think Russell should just sell the potato gun product again. The micro continuity, the potato gun. Like, uh, also another like um, Telman Knudsen. Um, I ran into somebody yesterday that was like, I mean, because I don't know what happened to Telman. I was like, where's he been? Like. He was so big and then he's just gone. Yesterday, we ran into a guy at Funnel Hacking. He like called him up on the phone. Like we, we talked to him and I'm like, what? I'm like, dude, if it weren't for Tillman, I bought like a $5.99 free plus shipping CD. Yes, CD that put into my computer that taught me how to code Dreamweaver squeeze pages to start building an email list. And I was like, I don't know if I'd be standing here making the amount of money I would make if I did not get that skill set from Tillman. 10, 12 years ago. So it's like just crazy the the thing. I think that for me, the first product I bought that set me on this track for video marketing is uh Video Boss with Andy Jenkins. Yeah. Did, did you That's did like, you see that one? I couldn't afford it, but I saw it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, was, it was well, I couldn't either. So I can't <laughs> remember. I, I got I got someone else to pay for it at the time, I think. Nice. nice. And, That's uh, and then by the time Video Boss uh 2.0 like even bossier came out then i could afford it and that was uh but that guy he was such a legend you know such a legend yeah andy was... i mean yeah he was he i mean that whole like world like the frank kern the andy jenkins that, in that era like because they're i mean i know andy passed away you know like a while back but like frank is still going um yeah. like jason mike Moffitt, feel same mike feel yeah. same jeff walker like all of those og internet marketers like i mean i still i mean one of the most amazing products i think on the internet um, is mass control. Like Frank Kern's mass control, that whole, like the videos he used to promote it. Like, I mean, that was so ahead of its time that I was, just, I, I mean, that I did it for it. Me and four friends went in and bought that product because it was $2,000 and we were all broke. I mean, we're all like broke. Like we need this, I want to buy it. And it was like, who has this on a credit card? Like somebody has to. Uh, yeah, those are the like the product launches were crazy back in the day. And do you remember this guy named Mike Kinnings? Yeah, my, yes, uh, Mike Kinnings. I, he, uh, my, yeah, you I, everywhere I, now. I yeah, yeah. He was also you big everywhere. on video, and he's the one who started producing the first uh, uh, video series. I think called New Money Masters for Tony Robbins, and that I was you that. know yes. New Money Masters. That was like a ten or twelve Masters. DVD set, and he interviewed mm -hmm. all the top internet marketers. That was pretty. Uh, like ahead of its time too. Like nobody else was doing that. And internet marketing was a new thing. You know, it's just like, what's this thing? You can make money online. And that, that yeah, people were just like, breaking down how they're doing it. Like, and like, yeah. they're like, wait. And then, oh man, I mean, I remember if you didn't have a huge email list, you just weren't cool. Like you had to have an, e an email list. And it was just like, and how that worked. Like I, I do, I don't miss that. But like, I, I do, I, have, I respect what that was. Like now it's like, I kind of love the internet now because I just think it, it leveled the playing field of like people that if you if you if you are good enough to get attention, you can get attention right now. And you know, there's no gatekeeper. Like it's TikTok, it's Reels, it's Shorts, and then it's podcasts, it's YouTube. It's like it, if you are good, you will get noticed as long as you kind of stay consistent. And back then, I felt like those guys they were kind of like gatekeepers a little bit. Like they. You had to be in the cool club and there's, and Hey, I mean, the more power to them. Like if you can control that club, you're obviously doing very well. Um, but it was like, you know, looking at it now, it's like, nah, I don't need that. Like I can start a new TikTok account tomorrow. 
I can have that thing get a million views in a co- in like two or three months. Like I don't need anybody's help anymore. And if you want the information on how to scale a business from you know zero to a million plus, it's just watch Alex Hormozzi's free stuff, and it, it's got everything in there. Like he's yeah. he's kind of taking to the next level where it's just like there's literally probably a, you know one out of a thousand of these influencers who have something to sell that Alex doesn't already cover in one way or another for free. So that's that's know, pretty he, cool. But he but then changed it's, the game too. He did. Like, as he did. far as like you know. Like even Every- with his last book book launch, you it, it's going to be very hard for people to sell courses based on what happened, what he did. Um, you know, I mean that's that's why I'm more I'm for I, I'm I'm kind of an anti course guy. I like service business. I like I like coaching. Like I like you know stuff like that. But that's uh you know with that with that you know with Alex. Like I mean I, I just love disruptors. I mean I've always been the guy. You know like people I'm like that you can't just like yeah you can't do that. Oh I'm going to try. <laughs> oh, it worked. We did that, you know, and, yeah, and that's kind of yeah. how like e- even the TikTok, like everything that I've done has started, even my videos now, it's like, I'm like, well, how many videos can we make? Or like, can we scale this? Can we, can we make so an let's educator talk about that. Mobile? I, I was reviewing some of your, your videos and you put a number out there on how many videos you shoot in a day with your clients. What is that number? It varies. Um, a minimum number that we have to, and I say we have to, because obviously when you're charging high prices, there's expectations that need to be met. Um, we, we must get a hundred videos. Um, and we are unique. I mean, I, I've made videos about it, so it's not like I keep it a secret, but we, we film multiple hooks for every single video we produce. So for every video, we essentially make three variations of that video. Um, and in one day, if you technically count it, we can leave with 300 videos. Um, obviously that's variations. It's like a hundred fresh videos and some clients can do more. Some can, can't hit that number. We have to do two day types of shoots. Um, but we've gotten very optimized with how we film, um, obviously with frameworks, SOPs. And, um, I mean, I have a really skilled operator that's kind of helped come in and like, I'm like, we have to hit these counts because I mean, for most of our clients, you know, we're posting two, three, four, sometimes six times a day. And it's like, unless I want to be flying out every single month or every three weeks to film with these guys, we got to hit higher numbers. And, and we, you know, it's more or less, it's, you know, it's basically batches of 10 to 15 videos. They change their shirt. We vary locations to a degree. Um, but we really just focus on the actual, what is being said, not so much like cinematography and like creative angles. It, you know, and everybody we work with is, they're, it's the content and the to... delivery that drive the views mm-hmm. more than more than anything, because yeah, uh, I, I, and it's it kills me when I have a client sometimes they're just like, well, no, no, I can't do this because I don't have this right camera or the background sucks. And I'm just like, God, you got to You got to be kidding me. Happens too often. But what you just described there about doing, you know, 10, 15 videos, changing your shirt and stuff like that. So uncanny is everything you're telling me is really familiar. I had a program pre COVID called 52 and 2, where we'd shoot 52 medium I, format I heard about your program. That's how I found days. out about you. Yeah. Oh, dude, that's so cool. Yeah. So that's what... Because that's you how... did that with... Uh, you worked with Taki, correct? Taki, yeah, yeah, Taki. Was... Actually, I'm yep. right now, I'm at a resort with Taki. Uh, and we're oh, hanging out, incredible. creating some content and stuff. Um, nice. But uh, yeah, because I, I do all his stuff. But uh, I had, you know, Grant Cardone doing 52 and 2, Tony Robbins, Dean Graziosi, Russell Brunson. And, but this is you know, us flying a whole crew out. This is like a four or five person crew. We'd rent a luxury Airbnb kind of location, set up eight sets. And then we'd actually have people go from set, set to set. And then there'd be a makeup artist catering and everything. And I, what I was trying to do was have people have that, the TV or Hollywood production experience. And literally I would have people show up and, you know, I hire local crews a lot of times. I'm like, what do you have? And then they'd show me other gear and I would just pick what looks big. I, I know what everything is, but these guys, when they show up on set, they just get like, wow, all these big reflectors and that looks like a yep. fancy camera. You know, it's got a little flag in front of it, right? Yep. <laughs> and and that is, the, our happiest clients are the ones where we just brought bulky gear and they got they got to feel pimped out and they shot photos for Instagram and stuff. Um, but I, I could have shot the same thing with my iPhone. It would have been, you know, the, the actual online impact would have been the same probably. And we, and we, I mean, I mean, we do is gear. I mean, like, I know people get stuck on that. Like I, I do think, I mean, I mean, and I've seen your stuff, like the quality of your work, like, I mean, you obviously use nice cameras and lenses and like, but it, it doesn't discredit like the effectiveness of an iPhone, but 
I just think from an efficiency standpoint, you know, if you're filming a hundred videos in a day, it's the iPhone is hard to make that happen. Um, mainly for storage issues. You're going to burn yeah. through storage. It's, Battery, it's not all a, that. Batteries. It's not as organized when it comes to like file management. And that's the thing too. I mean, nobody talks about that. Like when you film a hundred videos with three variations, like file management is in, in, in a major issue. You know, I, so up, we I, had I a whole was... full-time DIT on site the whole time. And yep. they're just, they're just dumping cards and organizing while we're shooting the next one. We just keep swapping cards, swapping cards. And that, that was a full-time yeah. thing. Yeah. Essentially we have, I mean, we have editors that oversee like the footage and like they're, they're like pods or teams of editors. And then they like, but our file management is like, I mean, cause we're editing, you know, so many videos like, and it's just like storage and like, you know, it, it, it's definitely, I think that's an underrated thing that nobody talks about, especially, you know, that's why it's like, oh, you can when do you're doing it at scale, like, then it becomes mm -hmm. a real thing, right? Yeah. It's like, oh, you can use your phone. It's like, well, you can, but have you ever put a hundred videos on your phone and seeing what happens? Like your phone just doesn't work right. Like it starts like spinning and it's like shutting down. It's overheating. Yeah. Like, you know, we make, and then when you're done, overheat. you got to airdrop the stuff and then it's, <laughs> <laughs> yep. yeah and sometimes airdrop fails or like it airdrops it out of order and it's just like oh like you know i think that the the phone advice applies to anyone who's shooting their own stuff and they and they're getting stuck on even starting because they think they need fancy gear and i'm like no use your phone that's going to be just fine yeah most of my big videos on my account like people i look the interviews like we found that phones when you're interviewing people like like my like we they're called man on the streets you know like i'm sure you know like it's like you know it's like where i'm just asking people questions like we found that the phone works better than the camera not from an like an efficiency standpoint but guys it's they're not they're not intimidated by the phone like i can walk up to a regular person ask them questions if i have a a73 with a big lens and a mic and like you know a light like a reflective you know it's like they're like all of a sudden they're intimidated and they're like no but i roll in with just a little baby road wireless mic hooked to an iphone and I'm like, yeah, it's just a, just a quick video with the phone. Um, you know, I get way more responses doing that than I do with the camera. But like, obviously here I have, you know, a nice setup. If I'm filming in my studio and we're going to do 20, 30, 40, 50 videos, like it's with a camera, you know, but, but the interview style stuff, they're generally very fast paced. And we use a phone for that. I mean, it's an iPhone 13 pro, you know, so it's, and I mean, I might upgrade to the new one just because, you know, why not? But. <laughs> yeah. Uh it, it's, it was the most uh, underwhelming presentation ever, but that's a whole other story. Uh, yeah, I feel like that's Apple as a whole, <laughs> but I'm like, I don't want to uh, use anything else but Apple. So, Same, same. <laughs> Let's talk about real quick, uh, when you bring on clients, what's the biggest uh, issue that you're seeing they're doing wrong, like most commenting? So these guys are already typically doing at least seven figures in order to afford your services. They've already created some content, but they want to bring you in to take it up a notch. And you're probably going to go in there and notice stuff that's like, you know, is not working. Uh, what are the, the top things you're noticing? Well, I mean, the main thing is, and I tell them this up front, and, and, and I've had to really get, you know, working with clients in that range, as I'm sure I know you have experience with that, you're equally like managing egos as much as you are like trying to deliver like your product and what you're there to do. Because I yep. mean, I don't like, they're fragile. Like, and, and, <laughs> With good reason, though, because they're so successful mm -hmm. and they have such strong personalities. So when I when we go in with somebody like you, know, I've already researched their content. You know, I've already looked at what they're putting out. But if you're hiring me, you're hiring me because you're not happy with your current views. So whatever is on the Internet already is not working or else you wouldn't need to bring me in. So we have to then look at the person and go, I got to get everything out of you that you haven't put on the Internet. and I got to figure out what that is um, and what that does. And this is where the, the tension arises is I, I start asking questions and it, it brings all out of like, like, you know, let's take a real estate person for an example. Like they're used to making real estate content. They're used to making real estate videos. And like, I'm like, I don't want to make that. I said, how long have you been married? Like, what do you, you know, what's your favorite date night with your wife? Like, you know, how do you, how do you get over an argument with your wife? Like, do you, do you know, how many times do you call your wife when you're traveling? Like I start asking all these personal questions and they start answering, they open up and it becomes a really great conversation. 
And this is kind of like, I'm extracting what I think is going to go viral to then take this and turn it into topics and then start asking them and then start filming the videos. Um, but the hardest thing, that mental hurdle for them is like, it's not niche-based content. And, you know, they're so used to making content like, you know, I make this video, it drives this many leads, this is what happens. And I'm not going to sit here and say that that content isn't effective because it is. Like, you need that. But if your goal is, you know, massive exposure, which at no matter what, I think everybody, I just think that it takes people longer to get to the point where they need massive exposure. It's quicker for some people um, because most everybody starts with niche content. You pick a theme, you start talking about it, you start growing a following and you achieve, you know, smaller success. You're like you have like maybe a coaching program or a course and like, you're, you know, you're driving leads. And, but at some point, and it happens to everybody, I've been on the internet a long time, you know, you run out of people to sell to. If you only have 10,000 followers and you're selling to this, the same offer for a year, two years, like your sales will decrease because you need new eyeball, you know, and that's where the, the broad reach content comes in. And with, with the internet, the way it is today, with the algorithms, basically just spoon feeding, you know, people information, you just make a lot of content about information, things that could be shared that are based around your personality. And not only is that kind of like a, it makes people butt heads, it also extends out the, you know, because I tell people like, this is not going to drive an ROI immediately. This is going to take months. Like, and we've seen it. I said, for the quickest people, you're talking three to four months before, like we, we start, you know, going mega viral, start driving all these new leads, you're gaining followers, all this stuff's happening. It's, it's like, it's like a snowball. You know, because just because somebody watched one video about your favorite toothbrush, and then maybe they watched your video about how you own a duplex, and then they watch another video about how you get an argument with your wife and solve it, and then another video about like your favorite morning routine, and another video about your favorite book. Like they're seeing all these different facets of your personality. It's like they probably watched 15, 20 videos before they even hit follow. You know, and I think that that is the hard, and I think that's a, I would say a marketer thing. It's very hard for marketers. I was just at funnel hacking and people ask mm -hmm. me the questions all the time. Like, what's ROI? How right? do you make, yeah, what's the well, ROI on like your videos? And I'm like, let me tell you about the wrong that though. Question. Yeah. yeah that, that exact same thing. It's the wrong question. But I get asked that a ton because we, we do create ads and I've, I've got a client they spend $12 million per month on the videos, right? Like per month. And they're doing, uh, last year they did $150 million. And they, $150 million just in ad spend. And uh, they, that's, uh, I'll, I'll let you guess what the revenue is. Can't go into that. But the, you know, they're, they're big players. However, uh, and I've got people who are kind of like your clients. They just want the exposure. So we have people running ads. And when people ask that, I've, I've gone blue in the face trying to explain this concept of like, you know, there's exposure and there's ads and here's the difference. And, and everybody's question is, what's our ROI? How do I make money? And that's exactly why I created this podcast, because I come to the conclusion that there are as many ways to make money with content as there are people successfully doing it. Therefore, I'm just going to talk to people like you who are, who are making at least a million dollars a year and then just hear their story because every single story is unique. And I, I'm not going to explain it anymore. I'm just saying, watch the podcast. I got, you know, I think we're at 62 episodes now. There's 62 examples of how people are making money with content. Go. <laughs> and that's, and then on top of it, you know, it's just not me saying it anymore. It's other people's experiences and it's so much more fun. Yeah, it's, it, 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 it's, it's hard for, because like no matter what, whether you make an ad or whether you grow an organic following, you still have to make content. Like it, it's either way you're making videos. Like I tend to lean on the organic side and that's not because I, ha I think ads are bad or ineffective. Cause like people say that like, oh, you just like they hate ads. No, like it's just like for me and like the clients I work with, it's like, okay, most of them are already running ads. You know, so they want more, you know, so it's like, and then in my, in my case, I'm like, okay, they, and you work with a lot of people that run ads and you make ads for people. So you, you become a full-time ad creator because once you get ads that work, you have to do variations and multiple variations and rehooks and this and that you have to change and you're testing and you're trying new audiences. Like at the end of the day, you're, you're making videos all day. They're just ads. And then when you're an organic creator, you're making videos all day. They're just getting posted organically. So either way you're posting those those videos but with the organic which i think where organic has 
the long-term ROI over ads is that organic compound. And I mean, I know you, I've heard you talk about it before, like organic, you know, it, it, it may be small day one, but when, you know, when you get to podcast 50, things are different. Like back, back podcasts are getting listens, you know, new podcasts are getting listened. Like same thing with like, you know, with going viral on TikTok. Like, like I still have viral videos that went viral months ago that are still getting 200,000 views a week right now on my TikTok that nobody sees because they're only looking at the first nine, you know? So it's like these things compound and that that's the thing. It's like, you know, I think, you know, whether it's like, you know, you want to spend a grand on ads or you want to spend a thousand on organic. I think at the end of the day, you're going to end up doing both because I'm like, okay, I figured out the organic. Now I have all of these people that I've retargeted. Now I want to write some ads to my re retargeting audience, you know? I mean, so either way you're paying for it, whether it's a full-time video editor, whether it's an agency like myself, an agency like you have, you're paying money to make, to produce videos, you know? And, and I think people just, they get so twisted about that, but you know, and, and it's funny because I ask people, cause we work with some, like, you know, some of them, our clients, biggest videos have gotten, you know, like 10 plus millions of views. And they're like, well, like why, how, how do you think that makes me money? I'm like, well, if we make a video about where you eat lunch every day, when you were coming up, like when you, before you made money, you, you saved money. You know, an example, this would be like Chipotle. You ate Chipotle every day. Like, and this is what you ate. And because you did that every day, you saved money and you became successful. Now that video gets 10 million views. You would be hard pressed if somebody is a fan of you to go into a Chipotle and eat a burrito and not think about you. I'm like, yeah, you can't put an ROI on that. But I sure as hell know that if somebody sits inside of a Chipotle, I want them thinking about me, right? Because there's money in that. You know, that's taking relevant. the Coca-Cola approach, you know, they just billboards, every, like people just see it everywhere. They equate that with, with happiness, right? Coca-Cola happiness. And, uh, they've done a great job of that. Um, I, I've got a question for you. Um, you, you, you shared recently on one of your videos, a screenshot of your, your income growth, and it pretty much looked like a hockey stick, right? Uh, there was a lot of, you know, like kind of, you know, little squiggles and then pew. Tell me about uh, what do you think was the difference that made the difference around that, you know, that that inflection point? Yeah, I mean, I mean, so before I, I would say, you know, if we could take it back to like, we'll say, you know, when the world shut down, you know, that was when things really changed for me um, on a lot of levels. Like I didn't have much money when that started. Um, I had basically I had like agency clients. They had they had dropped because everybody kind of panicked at that time. Um, I had some even charge me back. I went negative into my bank account uh, for a little bit. Same, like, man. Same. Like, and I was just like, <laughs> man, like, I, like, I, I'm like, thir I'm 36, 37 years old. I'm like, I'm broke again. I'm like, God, fuck. All right. And prior to that, I would say that I was a really good six figure ish earner. Like, I, I wasn't, um, I, I couldn't make a million dollars yet. I didn't. For, and like, to, to say what made that difference was like, I saw TikTok as an opportunity. And I looked at it like, okay, I have an opportunity right now. I can figure this out. I can, I can, I can really go all in. And I hadn't been able to do that for anything prior to that. And when I say going all in, it wasn't like I had committed to things before. Like I had a couple hundred websites making affiliate commissions. Like I knew what commitment and discipline was, but it was like, I'm going to bank everything I have right now that this is going to turn into something. And it was, and like at the time I didn't have much. And I was convincing my fiance, like, or, you know, I'm like, hey, this is going to work. We're going to get rich off this. And she's like, again, oh, God, I, I love you, babe. Okay. You know, I, you know, and thank you. She's very supportive. So it's like, yeah, but it was, she's like, okay, like, what does that look like? And I was like, I said, I feel like I'm going to just take everybody's content and make them go viral because I'll figure this out because I'm going to figure it out for educators. And I, and I put, I went all in with the chips. Um, and, but I thought about it differently from day one. And that's, I think, where I said, I want to make a business out of this. I don't want to just do this. Um, so even before, like, so when I had my first clients, um, I had two clients that essentially, they were free. Um, I worked out a rev share deal, but because TikTok didn't make any money, um, I never made any money from them, you know? So like, I, I had the opportunity, but it, they never amounted to anything. They're two of my best friends. So like, I'm still friends with them to this day. Um, that's how I learned really quickly. It's, difficult to monetize TikTok. Um, but 
I had case studies and I had all these things. And I was just so focused on taking educators. I was like, the educators are going to be late. They're busy doing YouTube. They're busy doing their podcast. They're busy running their Instagram and taking pictures. I said, they're not thinking about this short form thing. And I, I put myself in that position like with enough risk. And then when the opportunity caught up as far as like, I, I just calculated it right and, and it worked. And I, I would say that was like, you know, what, when luck meets opportunity, you know, it's like, that was my moment. Like I was like, okay, I did this. And then it was just, you know, it still didn't make any money though. We had clients that were paying 700 bucks a month and it's going to take you a long time to get to a million with 700 a month clients. Um, it was then the, the confidence to talk to a Cardone and tri like charge him what I, you know, what I charge him. And then, produce the result. And I worked with, uh, you know, two clients that I think due to NDAs, I mean, we've spoken about them on this call. Um, you know, like I, I couldn't get them the results that they wanted. And I decided to just fly to them. I, I spent the money and I said, I'm just going to fly to you. We're going to film a hundred videos. Like I, and that was how that was born. And like, I, and then we came back and it worked and I was like, holy crap. And then it was like, and then I can charge more. I was like, because the results were meeting the income and they were meeting and people were willing to pay what I was doing. And it, it was just that, that constant growth of confidence, you know, and I think that people lack that today because of a lot of people selling things where they're not truly experts in and they're not true. Like, like they have, they have good ideas and they may be good at that business, but it's the number one thing. Like, you know, when I look at somebody and they're like, I can help you do this. The first thing I do is look at them. And I'm like, how can you, cause I get DMS all the time, Ryan, I'm going to get you, I can make your videos more engaging. I can do it. And I'm like, I got 7 really? million views this. Yeah. I was like, I got <laughs> really? 7 million views this week. <laughs> the, I'm like, they're copying and pasting that same message to a thousand people. Yeah. yeah. And I'm just like, you know, so it, it, and it, and it was, and then it was like the, so that confidence and then also hiring people. Um, you know, I currently have 14 contractors that work for me. They'll probably be W two at some point, you know, because I'm getting to that level where I might have to do that. Um, but it was like, I, like Louise, who's been with me since like day one, I was doing DM closing, like selling. I was with my friend Elliot Hulse. He has a really big following. I was DM closing on his Facebook, selling a 997 product. I was making around five thousand dollars a month. I was then taking that money and I was paying Louise to edit Elliot's videos because he was one of my clients. And I was like, I can't edit these videos because I need to focus on selling and I need Luis to do this. So I need to hire somebody to help me from day one and I need to train them. And then it was like, and then when Luis had too many clients, I was like, oh shit, we got to do this again. And then I was like, I, and then that's where I, she's always been a part of like my life, a girl named Savannah. She's one of my best editors. Um, I said, Hey, can I hire you back? I'm like, I got a business, like it's working. Like I, I, and she's like, absolutely. So I was like, okay, you're going to, so I was using the money that I was DM closing. And I was pay, giving it to them to edit for me. So I treated it like a business and I just kept expanding on that. And like, it became, how could I teach somebody something? Not necessarily, how do I do it myself? Because I, at that moment, I was like, if I want to take this to a million dollar level, I can't edit that many videos myself. Like it will never happen. And I, and so I think that that mindset adjustment was just like, and that was the catalyst and it went. I mean, we started like, you know, year one was pandemic year. We did by the end of like, it started around July of 2020, I think is when we like June or July of 2020 is when like I got like the first paying client. And by the end of 2020, we had made like 400,000. And most of that came from like September to December. And then the next year we did, uh, we did just a tad over a million. And then, and then this year we're going to do that. I, I, again, like now I'm, now I'm dealing with all the problems of like having a multi-million dollar company and I'm and dealing with those types of scaling issues, which like it, it, a lot of it's been hard for me because like, I just, I'm a creator. I, I edited videos and I figured this thing out and now like I have. Now you're running a business. Basically yeah. you're, man, you're management now. <laughs> management mm -hmm. I'm just putting out fires and I'm talking on, I'm, I'm doing calls uh, and like, you know, so it was like, I'm not allowed to edit. Like if I start editing, like my operator is like, what are you doing? You, you can't do that. Like I need you same. to do this. And I'm like, same. you know, <laughs> yeah. So it's like, 
And I'm like, well, I just want to, you know, I want to sit in my dark hole and edit videos and not talk to anybody, you know, like, so I, I think that it's allowing myself to change as and grow into that role too, I think is a big thing where it stops a lot of people. And it is a hockey stick. I, I've just never experienced like all of, I feel like all of the greatest like life achievements happen like, oh, it's like nothing. And then, you know, and I've even seen that, like people talk to me about videos, like they're like, how, right, how do you, you know, like, how do you make people go viral? And I'm like, YouTube shorts came along, right? And it was the last of the three. Like, obviously it was like TikTok and Reels, then, then YouTube shorts came along. And I was like, oh, we're going to go, I'm going to go viral here. Cool. I'm already going viral on TikTok. I already got the views. And I started, I started a new YouTube channel. I started posting every day. I started posting shorts. Nothing happened. I was like, what the hell? None of my videos are working on YouTube. Like, do I need to make new videos? Ended up, it took 189 videos to be posted. And then we got a 10 million view video. That's the game. It is. And now my YouTube channel, because of that one video, now it gets like a couple million views a month. Like, and I'm just like, but it, I, it's like, I feel like life and I mean, even platforms and like, you know, making money, like it tests you. It's like, it just wants to see how long you'll stick around. Yeah. Uh, and the, the algorithms have that. to be tuned that way because if they give too much attention to just like people who just get on there, there's a good chance that person is just dabbling and they leave. And then like YouTube is not serving their, their viewer base so well because they just have all these people who just come and go. They want to build that community type of that feel. So they're, they're really tuning it differently. I got a question for you. There was a talk you did. You're on stage. And I saw this cut up several ways across your platforms. And I'm not going to say them now. I want to hear it from you. You made a big list of things you don't do that a lot of people think is what's going to make videos go viral. What are the things that you, you don't do? Well, number one is hashtags. And that's not because I hate hashtags. When you're posting 100 videos a day, the act of posting hashtags adds like five minutes per account that you're posting for. So what people don't understand is when you're doing this amount of videos and you're posting this across this many accounts, like it's an average of five minutes per post per account. So five, so it's 15 minutes per client because we're posting like Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and, and, and TikTok. So it's 20, it's 20 minutes a day per client, multiple times a day for multiple clients just to post their videos. And I account for that five minutes because you have to download the video, airdrop the video, upload it, write the caption, and it, and it just takes time. So we were starting to bottleneck. And so you're, you're doing like, this all with mobile devices? Yeah, we, that, I, I don't use any, we don't use any automated services to post. Um, I've okay. had bad experiences with them. Yep. Um, I, have a, I have a girl, I mean, I, she makes $4,000 a month. She works seven days a week and all she does is post videos. Nice. Um, her name's Kelsey, nice. she's awesome. So she's got a um, whole bunch of mobile phones and she's just like- we have se you know? Yeah, we have seven. They're all labeled what accounts are on each phone. We, we swap them out. Um, we have multiple phones because like we have her logged in and then we have uh, Luis's logged in kind of like oversee things in case, you know, because let's say life happens and she can't get to a video and it needs to be pulled down. We have to have multiple phones logged in. Um, so yeah, that's another, like there's probably like 10 or so, uh, 12 iPhones in my company right now, you know, but that we just stopped doing hashtags and, and you know, I was like, I just don't think they matter. And then I, I tested it on my videos because I do everything on my account first. And I had one video I posted with hashtags and one video posted without hashtags. They were right next to each other. The video with hashtags got like 700 views on TikTok. And the video, video without hashtags got like 4 million. We haven't used the hashtags since. Th there, like the there were days when people used to search and browse by hashtags, but nobody does that yeah. anymore. People just, they just, you know, they get served up what AI things you want to watch and AI got really good at that. And, uh, it's, and now it's more about the, the user. I mean, the viewer retention, if someone similar yeah, to you, it, watch it, it through, they're going to show it to you. Yeah. And they're fed. spoon feeding them to you. It's I not mean, even so that spoon like feeding, man. It's an IV drip nowadays. Yes. <laughs> you don't even have to open it's your like, mouth. They just, just hard line yep. that. <laughs> it's like a, it's like a machine gun. Like, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. but yeah, so that was like the first thing. Like I, I, we just saw early on, we didn't need them. So we stopped using them. We saw zero decrease. In anything we only saw and is this just tiktok or other platforms as well we stopped doing it on every platform okay um i mean but the main the big the, the catalyst was tiktok like okay. that's what started it so that was like the first thing hashtags posting times uh because you know we were so busy when we started and we were editing like on average so like my editors now they average four to six videos per day five days a week um when myself Luis, and savannah 
were originally the first three in the company, we were each editing like six, six or so, seven videos every day on our own. Like, and there was no AI now, like we were hand subtitling word by word. Like now at least you have Premiere Pro auto caption. Like there's a lot of things now that people have that like when we were word by wording these things, so they were taking hours and you know, there would be nights where we would finish editing at like 3 a.m. And in my contract, it said that a video was posted every day. And well, my day ended at 3 a.m. and a video got posted. So, and we would post at 3 a.m. and we'd wake up, I'd wake up because I have a kid. I'd get up at like seven to take her to school. Sure enough, that video went viral. That video got 200,000 views. And then we'd be, some days we'd be ahead. We'd post them at like 2 p.m. And we're like, oh, that video went viral. Oh, that video got a lot of views. Then we'd post, you know, it's 8 p.m. It's like, oh. Then we were like, let's just test and see if we could post all, like five videos at the same time, see what happens. And then sure enough, the ones that were going to get views got views. So we just stopped caring about posting time. And now we just post, you know, what, with what makes actual sense. Like we're not arbitrary numbers. Like it's not like a 6 p.m. every day. Like it doesn't matter. It can be 6.10. It could be 620. It could be 558. It doesn't matter. Um, the next was, yeah, the next was like reposting your content. Like you could take the same video and repost it over and over again and continue to get views. You don't have to change a thing. The algorithm, like your followers are constantly refreshing themselves if you're growing and nobody's really scrolling down. So they never actually see the videos that are like 9, 10, 12 videos down. Yes, the algorithm's going to serve them some at some point. But you can repost your best work and continually get views from it. So it's like people are like, like I, I just hate the idea of making one video and then you post it once and it's done. Like, yeah. Yep, yeah. new like, video. Like, a great example of that is I think I think currently he's TikTok's top performer, Zach King. Like he takes his old stuff and he just keeps re-upping it and doesn't doesn't need to do a thing. And all of a sudden, another 20, 30 million, you know, and then boom, just keeps just keeps re because it's 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 good stuff. And the new followers that came on, because as you grow, like you said, is you have a new audience and they haven't seen it yet. Just keep pushing it. What do you do about videos that you think like, like, like you put work into it or, or something was said and you think this is great, but it doesn't pop like you think it will. Do you go back and re-edit and repost it sometimes? We do. If you have like, I mean, there's some videos that are like, yeah, it's just a bad video. Like we can post it, you know, it's, it's good content, like whatever, you know, so It'll like, feed the fans. yeah, like it's, it's like you have to kind of be hypercritical of your content. Like, and, and I, and I urge people to be like that. Um, but if you have, I mean, we've had some where I'm like, a delivery was on point. Like the hook was good. Like this was good. Like, like the lighting was perfect. Like everything is, I'm like, why did that video not do good? You know? So we generally look at the watch time because that's the first step. Like let it, let it post, let it marinate for a day or so. Then go into the TikTok. And we base all of our decisions off the TikTok analytics because they're far more superior to all the rest. Um, at least YouTube has good, but TikTok for each individual video, you, like, you can't beat their analytics. They, so we look at the retention graph. We see where people dropped off. And then we take that knowledge and go, okay, like at four seconds, there was a 70% decline of the audience. So, okay, well, let's try a new hook. Let's just make a new four seconds. Then we'll upload it, see what happens. You know, round two might be, okay, at four seconds, uh, I said the word shit. <laughs> it's like, okay, well, let's cut the cuss word out. Slap it together, post it again. You know, and we've seen like so many things like that equate to hundreds of thousands, not millions of views, um, just for those simple little baby changes. Like we had one client, like, and he was talking about um, drinking and he used the, the specific alcohol, Johnny Walker Black. And it was a really good video. And we're like, it, and it flopped. And I was like, why did this, this doesn't make sense to me. Like it's a big client. This video should have done well. Well, it turns out we looked at the analytics. The second he said Johnny Walker Black, he lost like 50% of the views. It's because some, so, they have their favorite whiskey brand and that wasn't it, right? Yeah. So we <laughs> cut out. So like we cut out the part where he said Johnny Walker Black, sandwiched it together, uploaded it again. I think that video got like 400,000 views. Like just, and that's, like, I love that stuff. Like I think that that's so fascinated. Um, and that, I think that's what makes good, good creators different. Um, the ones that are willing to go in and tweak. And, and I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I wish I could say I like made this up, but like, I mean, Mr. Beast does this. People just don't realize, you know? Mm -hmm. 
Mr. Beast is, is he he tests thumbnails, he tests you know intros, he he you know he has friends watch videos before they post, like so many different things you know, go into making a, a successful video. I mean, when you're trying to get millions of views, now if you're just trying to post and you don't care, it's like, okay, well then, yeah, you can get away with it. But like, if you're, if your revenue is driven by, I need to get attention, I need to drive leads, I need to do this. Like this, these are the things that make a difference. That's why we started doing, you know, different hooks and like, and you know, now we're testing different lengths of videos. Like we're trying a short video and a long video because TikTok allows up to 10 minute video, you know? So, the, all these things, I think if, if, you know, for agency owners and people are like, and creators, like if you're not doing these things, this is, this is what warrants you charging a lot of money for your services, right? Because when these things hit, they hit and you're like, holy crap. I want to ask you a question about, uh, you posted something and you had an acronym about the three types of content everybody should be putting out. Could you, could you walk us through that? Yeah, so we have a couple frameworks in the company that have kind of like, you know, going back on early, a while back, we talked about how do you film 100 videos? How do you predictably get that? Um, well, we have a framework. The main one is called uh, the HEM framework, which is H-E-M. Um, it's short for Hemingway, which is like, if you're familiar with copywriting, the Hemingway app. And the reason that we even came up with this was because most writing gets run through the Hemingway app and needs to be taken down to like a second grade level so people can understand it. But when you have video creators, specifically niche-based educators um, and really smart people, they have a very hard time talking at a second grade level. So immediately when they make videos, they speak at a level of understanding that the average person cannot comprehend. So they're going to lose viewers because they need to dumb down their message. Well, most people don't want to dumb down their message. It's very hard for them to do that. So I was like, okay, well, how do we, how do we force them to dumb down their message without them realizing it? And that's where the HEM frameworks came to play. And the HEM framework stands for the H is hobbies and interests. The E is expertise and the M is mastery. And you could also categorize this as broad reach content, moderate niche, extreme niche. Like, you know, so it's, you know, your hobbies and interests are what is going to get you that broad reach. Things like, you know, do you like soccer? Do you like football? Do you like sushi? Do you like, you make videos about these things. They're all personality based. They're very controversial. They're very value driven. These are the videos that are going to go viral. They're going to get you millions of views, you know, then you have the second layer, which is expertise. And it, I, I, a lot of people start making content on the internet and they literally just forget about the entire person they were before they started making videos on the internet. Like I, myself as an example, like I made money as an affiliate. That's an expertise. I made six figures. I can call myself an expert at that. Am I a master at it? No. Like, am I going to continue to do it? No. You know, and then we have something like I was a door and window salesman at a retail place. I have retail job experience. I did that for 10 years. I'm an expert in that. I can make videos about that. Brought ex, you know, retail-based content is going to do far better than if I make a video saying, here's how you get a million views. Because there's, there's not a lot of creators that want to get a million views. So it's like, there are a lot of people that work in retail. So you know, expertise, you know, a way to frame it is like you have your hobbies and interests. That's the stuff that you would do for free. Like you, if you, you would do it if you never got paid for it. Like expertise is anything you've been paid to do up until this point, you know, cause if you've been, if money has been exchanged, you have value, you're an expert. It makes you an expert. And then we have the last layer, which is mastery, which is like, what, what are you doing that may, is making you rich? Like in my instance, it's like telling people how to go viral, helping them go viral, like making videos about that, making, making videos that I have a mastery in this. Now I'm confident I can say that I've done my 10,000 hours. Like, this is what's making me rich. It's going to continue to make me rich and I'm going to stick with it. So it's like you have these tiers. So now when you show up and knowing, like, you know, let's say you're an average person who wants to post 30 videos a month, one video a day. You're like, oh my God, how do I come up with 30 videos? Jesus. Oh, so daunting. I don't know what to say. Well, it's like, okay, so 80-20 principle, like if your goal is growth, 80% of your videos should be trying to get reach. So that hobbies and interests. Okay. So like, you know, I love my wife, so I can make some relationship videos. I love my kid. I can maybe make a parenting video. Um, I drive a BMW M3. I can do a car video about my car. I, I eat sushi five nights a week. You know, I cook spaghetti in a crock, you know, in a crock pot. Like, I mean, all these weird interests and thoughts and hobbies, you know, let's do three videos around parenting, five videos around, you know, woodworking, two videos around pickleball because I enjoy the sport. Like, and you're going to make the, and you're going to categorize out. It's like, okay, well, 
I was a valet driver in college. Let's make some va- let's make some videos about how to get tips more. So it's like when you're looking at it on paper, you're just like, it's very easy to kind of go, okay, three videos about this, four here, five here. Let's do one here, three here. Next thing you know, you've written out 25, 30 videos and you're like, oh, now I have video topics. But by doing the hobby and interest specific, it forces people to talk at a lower level, it forces them to talk and dumb down their message. Because when you go from like this video of like, you know, how to, how to the perfect date night for your wife, if you got in a fight, to then talking about how to invest, you know, cash in your 401k and turn it into a duplex. Your, your, your brain is trained to talk lower level because of the hobby and interest. So it's like you're, you start speaking at a lower level and not saying I'm trying to make any of my clients dumb, but if the message is consumed, it's relatable, it's going to get more views. So that's like the HEM framework. And then we have, a, we have a secondary one. So that's like how you use the HEM framework to come up with topics. And then once you make, or before you film and you make the video, after you have the topic, you use the CUB formula. And the CUB, the C stands for confusing, the U, unbelievable, and the B, boring. So before you make a video, you go, is this video going to be confusing? And if, if you cannot, if I can't go, yo, Ken, check out this video about X, send. And then you can't go, oh my God, that's a hilarious video, Ryan. I'm going to send that to my, to my wife. Babe, check out this video of, of like, you know, so-and-so, you know, bouncing a ball on their table. Send. It has to be a, a very easy text. And you can look at your topics and go, is this easy to consume? You know, and what makes this difficult is if you do multiple points in one video. Every video just has to have one point. All right, here's a video about how to title your video, send. Here's a video about how to save $20 at the gas pump, send. Like the more, and that's what, so the video can't be confusing. And it's also confusing if you're not using the HEM framework because you're talking in language that they don't understand. So, so it, those two things make it. Then you have unbelievable. You work with a lot of people that have made enormous amounts of money, that have done amazing things, myself included. On the internet, nobody believes you. Like if you say you've made a couple million dollars, we need proof that you made a couple million dollars. If you say you have a Gulfstream 700 jet, I need to see Gulfstream 700 jet. You know, if you own five Maybox, I need to see a few of them. We need pictures. We need B-roll. We need you standing in front of them doing the video. You know, so the unbelievable comes from just the enormous amount of people just spouting off these insane claims and, and you, you need to prove it. So whenever like somebody says something, we go, can we back check that? Can we back it up? I need proof. Send me the footage, you know? And then boring is, are you entertaining to talk? Like do people want to listen to you. Like, all right, is the lighting good? Is the set good? Like, are you in an area where it doesn't look like you're gonna, like, are you standing in front of a dumpster and a trash can in an alley making a video? Like, you know, is it aesthetic? Like, are you dressed well? Like, do you, do you look aspirational? Like, do you look like somebody, somebody wants to follow? You know, and then it's like, you know, and I can urge the viewers or anybody that's listening to this, if your videos aren't getting views, you can check off any of those boxes. It's probably confusing, probably unbelievable, or it's boring. You know, some cases there people aren't boring, but they're unbelievable, you know, or they're confusing. You know, so it's like it's just simple frameworks that we that, you know, little little checklist. <laughs> well, thank you for that. Thank you so much. And I'm I'm taking a lot of notes myself right now. Like my personal brand social media is very small. And I just I haven't everything's just been very niche stuff, just like for for people who have businesses here trying to monetize with it. That's all I'm talking about. However, I think I'm going to start putting in some more fun stuff, like lifestyle hobby stuff. You got and, to. Uh, I mean, you live an yeah. interesting life. Like you're, I, you're I on vacation do. right now. Like on you're vacation. With cool people. Yeah. yeah I, that's... Wait, wait, I mean, there's a term that we started using <laughs> like a lot in my, in my company and just as yeah. a whole. And I, I started speaking more about it. Um, it's aspirational. Um, you know, a lot of people make inspirational content. Like they want to inspire people. It's like people don't follow just because they're inspired. They follow you because they aspire to be you. So when people come to me and they're like, I'm not getting followers. And I'm like, well, you're boring. <laughs> you, don't, you don't look like somebody I'd want to follow. Like, and, and I mean, I know, and this is hard for people because it's the flexing mindset. And we work with Brandon Carter, uh, King Keto. Is, he's blown up a lot in the last year. Like he, he is superbly aspirational. 
Like he's wildly narcissistic and confident in his speech, but he's so aspirational. Like his audience loves him because they're like, I just want to be like this. There's the wealth, the physique, money. the the yeah. good looks, and then the, the charisma, the, swagger, the yeah, the swagger, the riz. yeah, like yeah, the riz, <laughs> right? All these things, like you know, and he, and Brandon, uh, you know, and I mean, I'm sure you experience this too. Like I, I I'm fortunate to work with the clients we work with because like I learn so much just from filming with them and talking to them. Um, Brandon was like, you know, Ryan, it's like, he's like, you know, people always ask me about videos. Like, he's like in content. And he's like, can I tell him it's like, that's by a thousand paper. And I was like, what do you mean? And he said, he said, it's not one thing. He's like, it's not just because you have a nice camera. It's not because you have a nice apartment. It's not because you, you have a good hook. It's you have a good hook. You said something of value. You delivered it in a way that was entertaining. You look good. You have good swagger. You have good They style. all stack. Good, they multiply. Yeah, it's like, yeah. you know, they stack. And it's like, it, it's hard to say what made this video work when it's like, well, you know, and you, if you want to doubt this, just look at all the girls that are very attractive that really don't say anything and are getting millions of views. Like, you know, most women aspire to look like said girl in video or guys aspire to look up with said girl in video and then they follow, you know? So it, it's the aspirational term is something I think the, the internet needs more of. For sure. For sure. And uh, it's actually interesting because I use that same term when I, I got so inspired when Alex Hermosi started making his videos and he doesn't do this anymore, but he used to start his videos with, I make a hundred million dollars, nothing to sell you. And that was like one of the best hooks. And I, what I call it is aspirational authority. It's something you, you make a statement that your audience wants, but then also sets you up with authority. And I started really working on coming up with that for my clients, aspirational authority openings for their videos. And it's actually worked out really well. So uh, that is good. I like percent backing up. Yeah, it's yeah, that's a great because there's you're really good with the terminology. I, I give you I want to give you credit like, <laughs> thanks. for that, man. You, you got good acronyms in, in a lot of your stuff. Uh, I, I try. I try. I think that the more catch they are, the more people will actually be likely to use them. Like 52 and 2. Like that one, that one really hit for me. I was just like, yes, 52 videos in two days. That is, no, that's awesome. That's why we kind of came up with like, like the cub, the hem. Like, and, and I have another framework. I don't have a name. Like, uh, that we don't have a name for it yet, but it's like, I want to, I want to share with you because I, I know you'll get value out of it. But it's like, it's like how we film each video to like hope that it goes viral. Uh, cause it, it's, uh, it's a hook. Uh, it's like good hook, story, and then prescription. And I stole prescription from Taki. Like, you know, it's like, so every video you make should have an amazing hook or some abrupt way to get somebody's attention. They have to stop scrolling. And then you immediately go into a personal story that generally has a lesson about what you're teaching. You know, and then once you finish that story, you share a prescription. Here's how you do this. And that model is most people stop at the story, you know, and when you include the prescription, you have what we call a complete video and you have also like a terminology we call one minute courses. So it's like you have a one minute course, like and you could have a one minute course on a lot of different things. It could be a one minute course on the most effective way to brush your teeth. Like, you know, and a hook for this could be, here's how you can stop brushing your teeth twice a day and brush once and have healthier, cleaner teeth. Like, oh, all right. Well, I'm tired of brushing my teeth twice a day, but I'm listening. And it's like, and then it's like a story. It's like, okay, when I was 17 years old, my, you know, my grandma was like, why do you brush your teeth so much? And, and then I was like, what do you mean? My mom told me I brush twice a day. It's what you do, but morning in bed. She's like, well, I want you to try this toothpaste. It's a really good toothpaste. It has fluoride. It has all this stuff in it. You try this toothpaste, but when you do it, you know, you have to do it for at least, you know, a few minutes. Like you got to go longer than you're used to. And it's going to burn a little bit but you're never going to have to brush your teeth twice a day ever again. And it's like, oh, that's incredible. So, you know, and it works. And like, look at my amazing teeth or yada, yada. And it's like, okay, so that's like a good story, but it's like, okay. And here's how you actually do that. So you're going to go to Walgreens and you're going to buy the Crest, like neon tube toothpaste. You're so going to buy two toothbrushes. I got you. I got you. Yeah. Uh, it's something really similar and it'll totally work. You can use this. It's called the three and three because there's three acts, right? There's the hook, there's the little bit of story, then there's the, the step. But then in the third stage, it was what I call the third act, act one, act two, act three, you put in at least three steps on how to accomplish it. So it's three and three, three 
act one, act two, act three, and then you're giving some how to's at the end with a minimum of three steps. So that, that'll totally work. Nice. I like that. Three, three, three. Yeah. I'm gonna try that. Three and three. What I usually say is stop doing this. What like that as a, as a hook, what to do instead to give the contrarian view and then how to do it in three steps or more. And, and, uh, yeah, that, that can totally work for what you're doing. And no, I like uh, that, that. I like that. What I found is when I combined like digits, numbers and, uh, and emotional words in my titles, they work so much better because we're, we're doing the, I know technically left brain, right brain's kind of been debunked, but it somehow it works better. If I say, you know, uh, earned a million dollars without, uh, without breaking a sweat, that's a ridiculous title, but what we're, there's a digital number and then there's an emotional hook, right? Three and three, again, we're, we're getting people out of just what they're typically going to hear, but then they have to take a tiny bit longer to process it. And it just seems to stick a little bit better. I, 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 I mean, I, and we have another one, like a you hook. Oh, like, okay. If you say Let's the word it. you. Did, well, that just works say so word, well. It works it so does. good. Like, I mean, like, I, 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 it's like you or I. Like, it's like, you need to do this to get this. Like, I do this to get this. So it's like one, when, when we test hooks, we test both variations, you versus I. You generally outconverts I. But the I is super commanding because it's like, this is how I do this. All right. And that makes it yours. It makes it your personal opinion. It, it gives that conviction. Uh, whereas like, you should do this to get this. You know, so, but anytime you were, the, were using the word you in the first few seconds, I would probably guarantee you're going to get more views. Yeah. For sure. I want to end this with one final question uh, for the sake of everybody listening. And that is you and me and everybody listening has probably been hit up hundreds of times by people saying, I will edit these videos for you. And they want to, you know, they, they make ridiculous claims, but some of them are probably really good. How do you navigate? Uh, how would you recommend at least people who get these posts to navigate? Like, is this worthy of investigating and seeing if I want to hire this guy? Um, and because it's just become like, a really low entry to low barrier entry uh, business where you could get cap cut for free and, and edit, you know, decent videos. Uh, how do you look at that? I mean, I think, I think everybody should start like on their own. So they learn how to speak. I'm not talking you need to have amazing videos. You just need to get the cadence of making a video every day. Then I think the second step would be to outsource it like in batches, like so many videos do 10 to 15 at a time, you know, start getting used to actually paying somebody to do the videos because what you're going to experience is a massive revision process when you use these editors, or you're just going to get shitty videos. Like you're just, <laughs> they're just going to send you videos that aren't good. I mean, I don't know that there is a good way to navigate it though. Like these, they are so incestuous that it's like, you're going to have to, like, I would say, try a couple of them out. You know, I would start it, it, the ones that are charging 10 to 15. I would probably avoid altogether. I would go for the ones that are charging like 30 to 50. That generally means they value their work more, which means they probably put more effort into it. And you'll know really quickly if it's worth $30 or $50. Like you'll see it, you know, there'll be like zero revisions. They'll kind of nail, like there'll be, it'll be structured well. It'll be, it'll make sense. It'll like, it'll move, it'll flow smoothly. Um, I would probably avoid Fiverr at all costs. Uh, I've just never seen good come from that site at all. But I mean, I, I have a feeling that everybody that's hitting those people up, like, they're wanting to have an agency. And I think that's the problem that we're facing right now when it comes to editors. It's like when you hire an editor, you should ask them, am I a, am, is it an agency editor or am I getting an, a single editor? And, you know, the reason I Because the quality that will because, vary because it gets passed around, right? Yeah, it gets passed around. And it's like, if they're charging you 30, that means they're paying somebody 10 and they're keeping 20. It's like, and, and then for context, like I pay my editors on average like 50 per video. Yeah, or, you know, it, it varies 30 to 50 plus bonuses. You know, so it's like, and I'm on the high end of the market. And I'm sure you are like, I mean, I want quality work. I mean, the clients that we work with, I can't have, you know, we can't have spelling errors. You can't have all these things that you, you will deal with. And the, the downfall of a bad editor is, is it compounds on itself because it, you end up with a huge mountain of videos that need all these mistakes fixed that the editor is like, you know, he can't even keep up. And the most likely because they're overseas and they're, hitting you up 90, 100 people in, in their DMs every day, they're just going to stop talking to you. And then you just lose money. And that's like, overseas editors ghost creators all the time. I know, I've experienced it. You know, just like I've had, I've had bad luck with certain countries. 
Um, I don't want to back countries. I, I've done that in the past. I mean, people can find that content, but uh, you know, it's just you know, certain countries provide better editors, and they're. And then the other thing is, you know, I found that when people are charging like 30 to 50, there's usually more of an English context, meaning that they understand American culture. And if you're an American, that, that is something that you don't realize you need until you hire an overseas editor who has zero understanding of American context and like slang and language and terminology. Because yes, they may know English, like I use the Philippines as an example, they know English, but they don't know english slang and like or english like current things like like the term riz like you know you'll say that they won't know what that is or and they and they'll put like the most the worst picture up at that time or like you know you know i would also avoid editors that solely use like b-roll sites like it's like no like if a lot of their videos like if they're showing you client videos and like they're utilizing client footage and stuff meaning like they've searched their instagram or their facebook for pictures and like like i just think those little details are what the edit these people lack you know like we work with our clients like we we only use their stuff you know partially because of copyright and we don't want to get sued you know you know or we don't want the creator to get sued because they're using like a, you know a piece of content that they weren't authorized for and that happens at the level of clients that obviously you work with and that i i work with i generally just ignore them and like I, most all of my editors have come from, you know, I mean, they have come from my, a couple of them have come from my following, but they were where I offered a paid trial. I was like, I'm going to pay somebody $20. So if you want to reach out, if you want to be paid $20 to edit this video, I did that once and I had 75 people yeah. pay me. Yeah. It, it, it's a very, it. very fertile uh, hiring environment right now. Uh, yeah, yeah and it's it's easy. i will say that that was a slightly overwhelming because like i almost got my paypal account shut down twice trying to pay everybody and then eventually i ended up not being able to pay like half of them because they were like random emails and i'm like i have no way to contact i partially that was my fault because i'm like i didn't i didn't think this through what it while it was good in merit i didn't think this one all the way through um but that was that's one of the way that i would do it and also i think I think LinkedIn is probably, you know, if, if, if it's somebody like a serious company or like they're making, you know, let's say 50 plus per month, thousand or so, like put an ad on LinkedIn, like, or use LinkedIn because you're going to find, I mean, that's how I found, um, we found our poster that way. She's really great. Uh, I found my operate, like my operator is big on link. Like, I mean, I've just found, and this is lessons from, from Layla, you know, like you get what you pay for and. You know, I, I, I truly believe in that. And, and I, I come from now from the, the, pre, the preface of I'd rather pay too much and then figure out how to charge more to pay and optimize because that person is usually better. Um, and I, I think the thing about a video editor is a good video editor doesn't need to work for you. Like a good video, a good video editor could edit their own videos and get views. Um, like they got to want to work for you. And, and it's, you know, and it's also kind of like something on the, on the creator, I, like just cause you hire a video editor, he's not, they're not like the, they're not magic. Like they're just editing your videos. Like you can't blame them if you're not getting views and you're not doing like growing, like, yes, they can, there's bad edits and good edits, but if you have a good editor and you're constantly on their ass about like, yo, like why are you like, I'm not growing. Yeah. Yeah. Like that's, that's not the editor's job. That's your job you know, as the creator to speak better, to act better, to be more <laughs> aspirational. So I think that that, you know, or don't get me wrong. Like I have lots of conversations with my editors about views because I, that's what they're, they're bonus for, like they're bonus by views. Like just some of my thoughts on paying editors and <laughs> things of that nature. Dude, thank you so much for that. And uh, you, we went really deep there, uh, all about working with your clients, uh, working with your own team, hiring and things like that. I think that anybody who's listened to this podcast or watched this YouTube all the way till now has had some like very invested interest in, in you. What's the best place where they can find you online? Uh, besides the obvious, um, yeah, I, mean, I mean, it's just, yeah, just I mean, look I'll, up your name, right? <laughs> yeah. It's like, look up my name. Uh, I mean, but Instagram's, you know, Instagram's home. Uh, like, you know, it's, I, I still, I, I, I don't know. Like I'm not big enough to where I can't see my messages yet. Um, I don't know if that'll change. I get a lot of DMs. When I see them, I choose to reply to some and not others. Um, but Instagram's like, I mean, I still use the app. I, I like Instagram. 
but I and I, I consume content on TikTok. I'm a TikToker. So it's like both those apps are like they're home to me. You know, but TikTok DMs are, you know, they're a little funky. So Instagram is just better on that regard. All right. So I'd encourage anybody who's listening, go check him out on Instagram, follow him. And if for some reason you feel like this is the 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 guy that you need to take your brand to the next level and you've you've got the investment money ready, then have a chat with him. I highly recommend it. A lot of my clients or not clients, my colleagues, people who are like doing well and speak very highly of him. And uh, I would say the same thing. So please do reach out if that's a, that's a thing. Ryan, any last words of wisdom you want to add for aspiring content creators who are listening to this? Just it's reps. It's like working out. So, you, know, you don't bench 315 on the first day. Um, you got to make a lot of videos. Like there's a number on my uh, TikTok account that like, I, I feel like nobody likes to pay attention to that. I like to look at all the time to remind me how many videos you made, it's, right? It's how many videos I posted and it's in yeah. the 1200. So nice. Like nice. you can't, you can't beat that. If you just keep trying, something will happen. Okay. Guys, that's it. Ryan, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. I enjoyed it immensely. And for everybody listening, I'll see you in the next episode. No hustle, worship here, we're a different breed. Action is what we got if action is what you need. Content capitalists, we're breaking the mold. Cause the old ways fading new stories to the toast. So content capitalists, get to the prize.